I'm in a series with Sheila called Family Matters, and uh, today I want to talk about the beautiful institution of marriage. God created marriage from the very beginning with Adam and Eve, and as you can read Genesis, you see that they had challenges from the onset. Marriages today are not exempt from challenges, but I want to bring the good news that you can have a healthy marriage and enjoy it, not endure it, and so many people are challenged with that fact. Even in our society right now, people are sort of giving up on the institution of marriage and say, hey, listen, let's just live together and we'll work it out. We don't need to be married. No, marriage is a good thing. Marriage is a God thing. And there's some myths out there about marriage that I want to share with you quickly over these next couple of minutes. There's three myths, but let's turn to Ephesians chapter five. Let's start there. And this is the foundation to some things I want to share with you. Ephesians chapter five, a lot of things in these verses of scripture, I don't have necessarily the time right now to talk about every point of them, but I do want to take you to Ephesians five and we'll start there. Ephesians 5, 25. Through 33. Notice what it says here. It says, Husband, love your wives just as Jesus loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Verse 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but she should but she should be holy and without blemish. So verse 28 states this. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Notice that, men. That's interesting. It says, he who loves his wife loves himself. Verse 29, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes just as the Lord does the church. Verse 30, it says, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this reason, watch this, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. What a powerful dimension there. Verse 32 says this, this is a great mystery I speak concerning Jesus and the church. Verse 33, nevertheless, let each one of you in particular love his own wife as himself. There's the key. And it says, let the wife see that she respects her husband. But there's some myths about this in in, in the context I want to talk about is we'll look at point number one of marriage myth, that your spouse is like you. Your spouse is not like you. (laughs) As a matter of fact, if you'll point those three points up there, marriage is a union of one flesh, not one mind. I think that is so powerful. Let me say that again. Your marriage is a marriage of union of not, your marriage union is one flesh and not one mind. Uh, Compatibility is based on character and values, not sameness. Sheila and I are definitely two different people. We've been married almost 30 years, and we're completely opposite on things. I think the opposites, as they say, attract. I don't, again, some people, you know, I hear people all the time that say, well, I fell in love with this person because he was just like me. You don't want your spouse to be just like you. You actually want them the opposite of you because the opposite of you is the better of you, in my opinion. And it's says a healthy a healthy relationship is when people understand their differences. There's the key. When you learn to understand the compatibility you have as a couple and learn the differences and that your spouse is not like you, and then you come in line with these verses of scripture in Ephesians, especially the male specifically, and learn the differences between a male and a female. Now, I'm talking about physically, but I'm talking about emotionally. I'm talking about the way they see things compared to the way you see things, the way they feel things, the way you feel things. When you do that, that, you'll understand that you can be not only unified, but you can have compatibility, and then you can identify one's strengths and one weak, one's weaknesses. And when you begin to do that, again, from the onset of my marriage, I had two tremendous people to help me in these areas, and that was Pastor Harold and Lou Nichols. They taught me how to simply learn how to read one another, to understand each other, and to flow with each other as a team. Everybody say team. We were not trying to compete but where we're trying to complete each other. And I think that's the beauty of the relationship that Sheila and I have. Again, we see things completely different, and most couples get at friction of that, but we choose not to be at friction of that. We choose to see through each other's eyes and then assess where we are as far as based on what she's seeing versus what I'm seeing and come together. And the key word is to communicate it out, to talk it out, not shout it out, not bark it out, but to talk it out and have a healthy relationship and a work relationship. Marriage is a powerful institution, but thank God, thank God when our spouses have a different point of view from us. You say, well, Pastor Brian, I want to be right in this situation. I understand that, and so does the other partner want to be right in the situation, but sometimes rightness comes from looking 
looking at it together and, and sharing another person's perspective. Like you're, you know, for example, if you're having something in your house as far as maybe your backyard, you know, one person wants it this way, another person wants it that way. Well, listen, don't override and overbear your point of view and what you want compared to what she wants or doesn't want. Learn to walk it out and talk it out. Because if you build, if you start building these points of resentment and these aggravations, they'll lead to other things. Number two, number two, marriage myth number two. As you turn to First Peter, well, they're going to show this First Peter three seven. This is a New Living Translation. It says, "Your marriage will never have problems." Okay. All right, then. I'm serious, people. That, that is so true. There are people that think today, listen, Sheila and I went probably maybe 12 hours without having any problems, and that was 30 years ago. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, the honeymoon was what? No, that, no, it wasn't. Really, it wasn't. I mean, with all due respect, we got back to the hotel. I mean, back to the hotel, got to the hotel, this is the day we were married, and we were getting in the hotel room. I'll never forget it. Bless her heart. And she was crying. I mean, she was crying the whole time, and I could not figure out why she was crying. But it was such an emotional transition in her life. And so I didn't have any teaching on this necessary, didn't have any instruction on this. But again, I had to, at that very moment, at that very time, I had to step back and assess, and I'll never forget it. We got all our luggage in the hotel room, and she was just sitting in this chair over there, and she was just crying. I mean, crying hard, uh, emotionally crying hard. And uh, I just went in the restroom, used the restroom, because, you know, I mean, it's a marriage, is, a, a wedding day is a lot of work, and a lot of things happening, and it's moving like this. And I just went there, I said, now, Lord... We've only been married for about four hours now, five or six hours now. <laughs> what do I do? I mean, this is problem number one. And I'll, I just, I, I was washing my face and just, 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 you know, just refreshing myself because you know it'd been fast pace. And uh, I just, I heard in my spirit, let's just, just go out to eat and let's just go get something to eat. Let's just go, let's leave this room and go get something to eat. And that was the key. We went out and got some something to eat and just communicated from that. That onset at that time, and it relaxed her, and it just brought her down to a place where we could have an understanding of what was happening to us, and the emotions of that moment, and that time being together for the first time, actually in a, you know, by ourselves. But the point of that is that we learn to address the problem right at the beginning, and the key to that was asking the Lord for his wisdom. I mean, when you learn to ask the Lord for his wisdom, then you can get his wisdom. Notice what it says in, in, in 1 Peter 3, 7, in the New Living Church translation, please. It says, in the same way you husbands must give honor to your wives, treat your wife with understanding as you live together. Notice that, men. It says, treat your wife with understanding. That means learn to figure her out. Learn to understand the way she responds and reacts. She may be the weak, she says right here, she may be weaker than you physically, but she is equal. She's your equal part in God's gift of your new life. Treat her as you would treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. Treat her honorably treat her with absolute reverence and respect because if you'll do this your prayers and your relationship with God will not be hindered and it knows what it says right there it says give honor to your wives give honor to your wives you know there's a verse of scripture I forgot uh, Hebrews 13 4 can you get that back up on the screen for me please I hate for y'all to, to, to go back here but I forgot this verse of scripture and I want to go back to the top and we'll continue with this Hebrews 13 4 uh, this is in the amplified version thank you so much thank you thank you Notice what it says here, and this ties into that verse I read. It says, let marriage be held in honor, esteem worthy, precious, of great price, especially dear in all things. Notice that. Let marriage be held in honor, esteem worthy, precious, of great price. Again, going back to marriage myths, uh, and the three points I want to make, it's foolish to believe that a marriage will never have any challenges. Personality differences should never divide us, but unite us. That's one of the things that I have so tapped into over the years of my relationship with Sheila is that we have learned to unite, be a unity front in our differences. She discerns people far better than I do. I am Mr. Believe everything for the best of everybody. I, sure, I mean, I am. I'm just that kind of person. And uh, yet she's discerning. There's other uh, characteristics about her that she sees things differently than I do. And I see things differently than she does. But that divisions, that, that, that different looks is the one thing that 
unites us. And I'm so thankful for her discernment. I'm so thankful for their strengths in my life that, you know, again, like for example, punctuality. I am Mr. Get There on Time. You can forget about Sheila being there on time half the time, okay? She works at it. She's getting better at it. And, and, and bless her heart, she's not doing it in any way to, in a negative way as far as she's usually on time, but she's always running behind, okay? I call it on more time. Anyway, but <laughs> anyway, when you say to be there, I tell her, when, and now I've learned from the beginning of our marriage, this is what I say, if the event starts at 2.30, uh, I'll just tell her to be there at 2 o'clock. <laughs> she's there at 2.30, works out perfect. So don't tell her my secrets, okay? <laughs> no, sincerely, she, she knows when to get there on time. But seriously, that, that, that's just the difference. It's not that she intentionally does that. This is the way she is. And that that's the way I am. I would rather be there on time than I would rather be moving ahead than behind. But notice what this other point says. Any healthy relationship involves consistent communication and work. There is the key to any marriage success. If you want to have a healthy relationship, regardless of it's marriage or not, there has to be those two things, consistent communication and consistent work and dedication. If you'll do that, I promise you a relationship will work. When you begin to put the, the priority of that relationship secondary, I'm telling you what, it's going to suffer and you'll begin to have problems and there'll be a breakdown and misunderstandings and divisions will open themselves up really quickly. Hey, here's point number three. Point number three, watch this. Marriage myth number three, your spouse makes you happy. That does not exist. <laughs> it does not exist. But the world tells you that it does. If you'll find the perfect love of your life, you know what? You'll just be absolutely in a bliss forever. That does, that does not happen. In Hollywood, it may be a fairy tale on the screen, but in real life, that does not happen. You say, Pastor Brian, you know, you're sort of destroying all the myths that we have created about marriage and the institution of marriage. No, I'm not destroying them. I'm just giving a real picture of what it's really all about. I mean, again, there's some things that we need to understand and things we need to appreciate about having healthy relationships. And yes, there is a work and a commitment and a dedication. But listen to these points here. Your spouse should make you happy, but they are not the source of your happiness. That will preach all day long. Let me read it again. Let me read it one more time. Listen to this. Your spouse should make you happy, but they are not the source. Everybody say the source. Notice that. They are not the source of your happiness. I love Sheila with all my heart. She does make me happy. She is such a helper in my life. She adds to my life. I'm so thankful for what she does and all the many things that she does so well. And I could go through the details, especially exactly what she's doing right now as far as ministering to precious children. That is the really one of the beautiful things that I married her for among so many. However, the source of my happiness is not her. As you go over to Matthew 6.33, Matthew 6.33 in the Amplified, if they'll take that on the screen for me for just a moment. Matthew 6.33, notice what it says here. Matthew 6.33, thank you. But first and most importantly, seek, aim after, strive after his kingdom, his righteousness. Notice this, his way of doing and being right. The attitude and the character of God and all these things, that's what they're talking about, by doing and being right. The attitude and the character of God. And then all these things, everybody say all these things. All these things will be given to you by doing what? The first part of that verse, what does it say? Seek first, most importantly, seek after with every part of your being the kingdom of God. The real way to happiness is not having another person make you happy. It's not things making you happy. If things made you happy, Hollywood would be the happiest place in the earth, would it not? Beverly Hills would be the happiest place on the earth. When I traveled for five years in my own calling, as far as Metro, uh, Brian Jacobs Evangelist Association, I was in a church in the Los Angeles area basically every 90 days. And uh, I just, the, the hotel that I stayed in was right next door to Beverly Hills. And at that time, I was a Starbucks coffee consumer. I mean, I just love Starbucks, the whole deal. And uh, anyway, I would go out there about the spring of this year to sow those churches. And um, it was amazing the people you would run into and the people you would see. One morning I was, uh, it was early in the morning. I mean, it was like 7.30 or 8 because I had to be at an 8.30 service or be at the church by 8.30. The service was at 9. Anyway, I said, let me go get me some Starbucks. And so I was near the hotel. And sure enough, right there parked in the 
beside me was Nicole Kidman. She was in a white Jaguar with gold trim. This Tom Cruise's ex-wife or whoever, she was married to Tom Cruise at the time. Anyway, she was getting her coffee and I was getting my coffee. And she was wearing this big white outfit type deal with a veil. And I didn't say anything to her than hello and just acknowledged her. I mean, I didn't talk to her necessarily. But I, as she was standing next to me, she was, get, she was waiting on her drink to be made. And I was waiting. It was just, just, just actually us in that moment, in that time. And I looked at her face, and I'm thinking, you know, on the screen, she's a very beautiful woman. But I, was, I began to look at her, and I think, man, that is a beautiful car. That's a, you know, she's got the jewelry on. She's got the, you know, you know, the whole outfit. I mean, she is decked out. But I could see, like, bags under her eyes. I could see the wear and tear on her face. And, uh, I mean, it's almost like she was getting that point of that cup of coffee to, you know, sort of revive herself. I'm getting that coffee just because I enjoyed the coffee and the smell. And I already had my prayer time. I was ready to go minister, and I was seeing her. And, you know, it just, it just settled into me. You know, you can have all that money. You can have all that. But if you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart, it's going to wear on your face. It's going to wear you down. And, uh, you know, I, almost to the point where I'm like, I felt sorry for her. And I went and got my little <laughs> runner car next to her Jaguar. I'm like, good Lord, this thing's, you know, it had to be a $100,000 car with a gold trim and all that. And I'm thinking, Lord, and, you know, I'm, I'm doing my little coffee. I had it a certain way. And uh, I'm sitting there watching her. And I just wanted to go over these scriptures. And she's sitting right next to me. And I'm like, you know, it, it sort of bothers you when people are right there. And you're thinking, I'm trying to study and pray. And I'm like, would you please? please move on. Would you go so I can have this car space to myself? And she kept looking at me like that. I kept, I kept looking at my notes and uh, I, I finally to the point where I just said, you know what? I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be embarrassed. I'm just going to, this is the days before cell phones. I just started praying and, and just started raising my hand. She left after that. <laughs> My point with all that is I could still see it as she was looking to me like this. And I was like, you know, I could see the wear and tear on her face. And I just want to make the point is, you know what? Having all that make, make you feel good, but having all that doesn't make you have a peace and a happiness. I was in the center of God's will. Even though she had all that money, she had all this, I knew I was supposed to be in the Los Angeles area. I knew I was supposed to be teaching at New Covenant Christian Center, I think was the name of it. I was supposed to be there on that Sunday morning, then I was flying back here to Fort Worth that next Monday. I was in the will of God. And I mean, I was as happy as a man could be. And uh, the point with all that, your happiness comes from the Lord, not from things and from another person. And when you get that perspective, ladies and gentlemen, you can do anything in life when you have the proper relational perspective and has a healthy relationship with Jesus. Next point, a healthy marriage is when you love Jesus first and eliminate being codependent on your spouse. You never want to do that. Never want to be codependent on your spouse. You want to be adding to them, not having them, you know, help you and be codependent on them. Again, I've seen this as a danger, especially as couples get into a place where, you know, they, they will not seek the Lord. They will not put the Lord first place. And if they were ever, anything were to ever happen to that spouse... I mean, anything were to ever happen to that spouse, their entire world would collapse. And I understand the point of the fact that, you know, you really, you would miss someone if something happened to them, but you don't want to be to that place where your whole life is completely dependent on them. Like with Ms. Lou Nichols, bless her heart, when she passed, when Pastor Nichols passed away, I mean, it was just a matter of time that she just literally went down so fast. And it bothered me. I did everything I could. I, we lived next to them. And I would go up there and do everything I could to encourage her because she had such a strong relationship. But she was so tied into her relationship with Pastor Nichols that not long after her death, I mean, things began to diminish quickly. And it discouraged me. And I don't want to ever see anybody come to that place where their whole life is dependent on another person. I mean, listen, it was sad that Pastor left her. It was sad, but they had 72 years of marriage. And they needed to celebrate that. My own grandmother, my, my grandfather on my dad's side, he passed away uh, when he was 73 years old. It was unfortunate. But my grandmother lived 26 years after him. And even though she missed him and she greatly missed him and she never drove, I mean, he did all the banking and everything, she completely rearranged her life, completely de depended on the strength of her inner self as unto the Lord. And I'm amazed that that woman lived in 96 all by herself on that farm that John Jones and Richard and I own today, and she was 
physically strong and healthy, and she did it by making the decision that Jesus was going to be the Lord of my household. Isn't that awesome? I mean, she loved my grandfather. She was a support to him. But like I said, point number C, your spouse, point number C, your spouse will never be able to make meet all your needs. Only the Lord can. And I know in my own life and seeing that situation, and please, I love Harold and Lynn Nichols with all my heart, but what happened there was a collapse of codependency on another person. And when another person left, I mean, their life literally fell apart. Your life should not fall apart just because your spouse is with you or is not without you or does this or does that. Your joy, your source of strength, your source of peace is not in whose relationship as far as on this earth you're with, but whose relationship you have with your heavenly father. I'm telling you what, marriage is an awesome institution. First Corinthians chapter 13, verses four through eight. Notice what it says here as we begin to close this service. I'm going to share these final points. Watch this. This is the Amplified Classic. It said, love endures long and is patient and is kind. Love never is envious nor boils over jealousy. It is not boastful, vainglorious, and does not display itself hauntingly. Uh, verse 5. There we go. It is not conceited, arrogant, inflated with pride. This is the love of God in you and I. It is not rude, unmannerly, does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or own way, but it's not self-seeking, touchy. Well, go ahead. The next verse. Self-seeking. It's not touchy, fretful, or resentful. It takes no account to the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Verse number 6. It does not rejoice in injustice and unrighteousness, but when righteous, when rejoices, when right and truth prevail. Verse 7, watch this. Love bears under anything and everything that comes. Watch this. It's ever ready to believe the best of every person. This love's hopes are fadeless under all circumstances. It endures everything without weakening. And watch verse 8. This love never fails, never fades out or becomes obsolete or comes to an end. When you have the love of God, priority one in your life, in your marriage, in your relationships, this love that I'm talking about in 1 Corinthians 4 through 8, especially the Amplified Version, this love will never fail. Marriages can disappoint. Relationships can be frustrating. But the love of God that we have for each other, the love of God that God has for us, the love of God that you want is center place in your life, which is the priority one of your life, that love will never fail. Sheila can do things to frustrate me. I can do things to frustrate her. However, we love each other. And that love that we have for each other is not based on flesh. It's based on faith in God. It's based on his love. And when we choose it that way, then there are three things I just want to leave you with as we close this service and begin to wrap this up. These are three choices or three things to choose as far as a healthy marriage relationship. Choose to understand their feelings and how they see things, especially the last part of that, how they see things. How are they perceived? things. Number two, number two, watch this. Choose to be generous. Outgive your spouse. I mean, by giving kindness, attention, regardless of the emotion. You say, Pastor Brian, you just don't know what they did to me. I know, I know, I know, I understand, but I'm talking about the law of giving. I'm talking about the law of kindness. I'm talking about being kind regardless, because if you'll sow that kind of kindness, God will do other things in your life far greater than this frustration that you're going through. I promise you, God knows a way. God has a way of turning things around. And then number three, number three, this is very important. Choose your marriage relationship as a number one priority. If you don't do this, if you don't place it at the top, I'm telling you what's in danger of falling apart. Most couples today, what they do is they'll put their job, some other situations. Well, I, you know, I, you know, I have a relationship with my spouse. I understand. But that relationship with your spouse is priority one. If you'll make it a strength, I promise you, it'll strengthen the other relationships. If you'll make it a priority, other things will have its place in your life. When you give it divine attention and divine order as unto the Lord and actually honor him the best way you can, well, what about my spouse doing this? What about this? And what about that? What if a person or what if a couple's on the brink of divorce? What if somebody's watching me right now and they're dealing with the fact that they may be on the brink of divorce? Let me share it like this concerning divorce. This is my personal opinion, okay? If a spouse is abusive, using you physically. If a spouse is, I call it the, you know, I call it basically the three A's. These are my three A's. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. This is just where I, if there's adultery involved, if there's abandonment involved, which means leaving, or if there's abuse, then, that, then, then there's time to move forward and move away. I met with a man Wednesday night where uh, his spouse was abusing him, a, a woman abusing a man. It wasn't physical abuse. It was, it was verbal abuse. 
And she was just, you know, demeaning him. I mean, he has a tremendous job situation, has a great income, but she was demeaning him as a man and saying, listen, you know, you'll never be this. You'll never be that. You can't do this. You can't do that. I want to control everything about our marriage and uh, you do what I tell you to do. And that's just not going to work. And she was abusing him and uh, she would abandon him too. Also in the fact that she separated, she chose to separate from him. So those three A's, constituted, you know, again, for me to say to him, then you need to prayerfully consider what your next step is, and that possibly is seeing an attorney. And again, I'm never for that, but to those three A's, those are three A's that I believe that have to be scripturally looked at because they destroy a relationship, especially physical abuse, especially adultery, and finally, even the emotional abuse. You have to, again, these are dangerous things that Satan plays into a relationship to destroy it. However, God can turn those things around. I've seen him turn them around, especially in the adultery situation. I've seen it be turned around. I've seen other things from people come to a place of abuse and control that God would heal their heart. So I'm not saying that it, even though this one of those areas has been violated, it's impossible. I'm just saying the news about it is simply this. When you get into perspective and run to God, with that situation, he can heal it. Most people do not. Most people do not do that. They run away from God. And when you run away from God, Satan has his way and destroys that relationship. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's what we don't want to happen. We believe God that he can restore relationships.